thank you, Dr. Ellen Bogan, and uh, and uh, I want to thank the uh, Department of Neuro Neurological Surgery for for uh, hosting this. I also want to uh, recognize a couple of guests here today. I called uh, all of my friends, and both of them showed up today. Uh, uh, Dr. Terry Rogers uh, from the Foundation for Healthcare Quality is here, and uh, <laughs> oh, there you go. I knew you were there somewhere. Uh, the, uh, the foundation uh, sponsors a number of advocacy programs uh, aimed at improving healthcare quality for both patient and the, uh, and the industry in general. And uh, for me, he provides a, a very uh, great perspective into, into healthcare quality matters. And he has a gift for being able to boil down a, a complex concept into just a few simple words. And, and a few simple words are, are best for me. Um, I also want to mention that, well, as uh, Dr. Ellen Boga said, my wife is here today and uh, my, my other special guest. Um, she has a, a very unique uh, outlook or perspective on the healthcare system. Uh, we were just talking the other day about, uh, she's, she's thinking about going into the hospital for surgery, uh, for elective surgery in, in the next year or so, and uh, we were talking the other day about when she's been in the hospital, and really, other than to have our three children, she's never, ever been in the hospital. But her perspective is from the uh, patient advocate viewpoint, which is huge. And um, seeing as how you're on one end of that spectrum, uh, I, I just kind of want to emphasize that the, the other end of that, of that spectrum of healthcare, that the, the, the patient advocate and listening and, and hearing what they have to say is so critically important. Um, this talk this morning, how are you guys hearing me okay? Am I a little too loud? No. Okay, all right. This talk this morning is uh, going to be a pretty uh, vast departure, as Dr. Ellen Bogan mentioned, from your uh, normal grand rounds. Um, the, uh, and, and it seems appropriate because uh, what I'm going to talk about was a vast departure for pilots 40 years ago from the way that they did things and the culture that we had to what it is now. So, um, a few, I guess, administrative things I want to mention, or I guess disclaimers or remarks. Uh, the first thing is that uh, I talk from the perspective of a pilot and a pilot only. Uh, as uh, Dr. Elbogger mentioned, I've, I've been doing this for over 40 years. Uh, so I think as a career, I, I think I'm stuck with it, I'm not going anywhere else. But, uh, I don't claim to have any great insight into the healthcare business other than the anecdotal uh, information that I hear every day, uh, that I read about, and, and that I've done in my research. Uh, but it's important to note that what I'm talking to you about is from the perspective of, of an aviator. Um, you might hear a little bit of bravado or, or bragging about our safety record, but that's what I'm here for because we had such a, uh, we've had such an incredible run for the last 40 years that you'll, well, I'll kind of expand on that a little bit, but uh, we've had a tremendous success rate. And when I boast about zero accidents and, 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 our, and our tremendous uh, success in this area, uh, I do that with the thought in the back of my mind that it could change in a heartbeat. And I don't think that the error rate is going to go up significantly. I think we've got a, a handle on that but the fact that an accident could happen at any moment is something that we're very, very much aware of. And every day when I go to work, um, uh, and I think every pilot has to fight the, the tendency for complacency because uh, it's, it's very easy to say, well, you know, we've, in the case of, of, of commercial aviation in the United States for the last two years, we've had zero major accidents, and that's pretty significant. So it's pretty easy to get to sit back and say, well, we're, we're just kind of go along for the ride, especially with the automation that we have and so on. Uh, another uh, point that uh, I'm going to make is that uh, this uh, talk that I'm giving you today is really based on a, on a, on a uh, course uh, uh, that we teach uh, to corporate flight departments. And that course takes at least eight hours to complete. Some, some uh, people stretch it out to five days, but uh, I won't, won't uh, hold you to that, but, but uh, I've boiled it down to, to a 90-minute uh, uh, talk. And 
Um, the reason I mention is that when you go away today, you're, you're going to say, well, that was interesting, but there's, there isn't there more. There might be something that I missed. And, and so I'm going to touch on the high points of a lot of these different concepts. Uh, but there is a lot more. And, uh, and if you're interested, we have a solution for that. And this is the last I'm going to do to hawk this book, but uh, if you are interested, the, uh, we do have a website for the book. It's beyondthechecklist.com. Uh, but I also encourage you, if anybody has a question or, or wants further information and just wants to talk, uh, I am available. Uh, my, uh, my first name is Patrick, and if you just say Patrick at beyondthechecklist.com, you can find me. And I also have business cards up here if you want to, uh, you know, again, if you want to reach me. I'm always interested and always open to to talking to healthcare professionals because I always go away with a greater uh, amount of knowledge than, than uh, what I started with. So then the last remark that I want to make in, in uh, preparation is uh, my uh, academic credentials are, as uh, Dr. Ellen Bogan mentioned, I uh, got a degree in aerospace engineering and in fact I went to, Bo went to work for Boeing right out of college. And uh, I was on the path to being a rocket scientist. Um, and then I went in the Navy, and that was the end of that. But uh, so it, 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 I find there's a certain amount of irony that here I am. I was asked as a rocket scientist to come and approach a, a room full of brain surgeons. And uh, so to drive the point home, I'd like you to watch the following video. Oh, no, no, glad you can make it. Can I get you a drink? Yeah, something soft. I'm driving. Parking is an absolute nightmare around here, isn't it? That's reversed into the tiniest of spaces. Still, I managed it. I mean, parking is not exactly brain surgery, is it? <laughs> and I should know. Why is that? Are you a doctor? Careful. Not a doctor. I'm a brain surgeon. Big difference. Big difference. Yeah, I actually know a joke about this. What's the difference between a doctor and a brain surgeon? One's not exactly brain surgery. The other is brain surgery. <laughs> Lionel, here's your drink. Lionel's brain surgeon, you know. <laughs> yeah, he mentioned it. <laughs> oh, Jeff, they keep you late at the Space Centre. I've always Have you met Lionel? Uh, no, hello, Lionel. So, Jeff, how do you earn a crust? Uh, well, I'm a scientist. I, I work mainly with rockets. It's, <laughs> it's um, pretty tough work. Um, what do you do? Why, well, I don't mean to boast, but uh, I'm a brain surgeon. Brain surgery. <laughs> oh, exactly rocket science. That's one of those videos that you know exactly where it's going, but it's always fun. I've probably watched it about a hundred times and I like it every time. Uh, <clears throat> so the plan for today is, uh, you know, I was asked to come here because uh, the specifically because the commercial airline industry, and when I say commercial airline industry, I'm talking about Delta Airlines, Northwest, and United, and all the, the big major carriers, have really undergone a renaissance over the last 40 years. Uh, they made a conscious decision. Uh, the airline management, the unions, uh, the, the operators, the pilots, uh, and the manufacturers and the regulators all uh, came to a consensus that something had to change. And uh, we've had a pretty amazing run, uh, which again, I will get to the statistics momentarily. Uh, and it's so amazing that in the last two years, something that is unprecedented is that in 2011 and 2012, we have had zero major accidents. Doesn't mean we haven't had accidents, haven't had incidents, haven't had close calls, uh, but by the, 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 their classic definition, we've had zero. Um, Passengers today face far greater risks getting to and from the airport by orders of magnitude uh, than they do once they walk on that aircraft. And that's a pretty amazing thing considering what airplanes do. Um, there are a lot of reasons for this. Uh, the, uh, the machines are better. Uh, the, uh, the, the pilots, I think, are, are certainly better trained. But part of that training, a big, big part of that training is crew resource management. And, uh, it's been identified as a major factor in, uh, in uh, improving our, uh, our accident or error rate. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about a little bit about the history, wh why we got to where we, why we got to the point where we had to do this, um, and uh, how we got, and then how we proceeded, how we, and how we trained to it. 
uh, and how it has literally transformed uh, how we do business. The, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the fundamentals, the human factors fundamentals, checklist use uh, and misuse, and uh, theory and fact behind that and a little bit about risk management. Threat and error management is a term that we use a lot, which is basically just risk management for anyone in a high reliability industry. But I'm going to start out with a story. Um, and uh, there's no mystery in, in, in where this story goes now, because Dr. Ellen Bogan let the cat out of the bag, but I'll tell it to you the way I had planned to. And that is, uh, this is a story, uh, we'll call it a case study, about a 51-year-old patient who I uh, got up one Saturday morning and a uh, very clear day and decided to go for a bicycle ride. Uh, it was the first day after 29 days of straight rain, typical Seattle winter. Uh, our patient uh, went for a bike ride halfway through. He had an explosion and when I say he had an explosion, I don't mean he heard an explosion. He didn't pop a tire. He actually uh, had an explosion in his head. And the way he describes the explosion is that it's as if somebody took a drill and drilled a hole in the back of his head and stuck a fire hose up there and turned it on full blast. And the, that's how intense the pressure was, if you can imagine such a thing. Um, the uh, uh, patient was uh, fortunate enough to have had a cell phone with him and uh, also uh, blessed with the fact that there was a fire station just two blocks down the road. So when he called 911, the uh, the aid, aid car was on scene within uh, just a couple of minutes. The uh, paramedics stabilized him, took him to a local hospital where he was uh, accurately diagnosed as having suffered a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now, for those of you that are uh, familiar with the pathology and the statistics behind that, and I'm sure most of you are to some extent, for those of you that are not, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about it. There is a chance that for one out of 10,000 chance that a person will uh, suffer a subarachnoid hemorrhage. That means that one person out of 10,000 will suffer that in a lifetime. And uh, that's pretty remarkable odds of it happening. In fact, probably nobody in this room would it would happen to, and nobody in this building, nobody in a several square block area. The odds are that it would not happen to them. But the survival rate or the mortality rate is not so good. And it hovers around 50% of the people that have a subarachnoid hemorrhage do not survive. Um, of the survivors, about half, maybe a little bit more than half, have permanent co cognitive deficits uh, similar to stroke symptoms. And uh, that's pretty remarkable. In fact, the literature that I read says, in several places, it says a subarachnoid hemorrhage is often associated with a poor outcome. And I would say that's kind of an understatement. And as you might have guessed, I think HIPAA laws allow me to talk about myself. I am that patient. And seven years ago, I was the 51-year-old, so you can tell how old I am now. Um, I was the 51-year-old that went for that bike ride and had that hemorrhage. Uh, I tell the story for uh, a number of reasons. One of them is, when we talk about CRM, we talk about uh, communication and teamwork and leadership and uh, uh, collaboration as some of the cornerstones, cornerstones of what makes this work. And all those factors were evident in this case. I was fortunate enough that, that communication occurred throughout uh, that, that allowed me to, to, to survive this uh, in spite of the, the kind of overwhelming odds of it maybe not turning out so well. Uh, the second reason that I, <clears throat> that I bring it up is that uh, is because of you in this room. Uh, I think that it, I owe a debt of thanks to the people and your predecessors that, that do the work you do. Uh, today, uh, it seems like there is a book of the month club for surgeons to write, from mainly Johns Hopkins University to write books about uh, all the failures in the healthcare system. And pretty soon, I mean, you, you're getting kind of a bad rap and I, I, I'm here to, to testify that it's not all true. Uh, you guys do a pretty fantastic job. The, uh, and then the, uh, the third reason that I mention this is because of the, the uh, role of my wife as a patient advocate. And uh, I do have a video that sort of describes her role in this. And if you just substitute, uh, instead of the word, my daughter, substitute the word, my husband. And when she says she needs her medicine, just substitute the word, he needs his drugs. 
Excuse me. It is after 10. Give my daughter the pain shot, please. Mrs. Greenway, I was going to. Oh, good. Go ahead. In just a few minutes. Well, please, it's, it's after 10. It's after 10. I don't see why she has to have this pain. Ma'am, it's not my patient. It's time for her shot. You understand? Do something. All she has to do is hold out until 10. And it's past 10. Never, ever, ever underestimate the value of a patient advocate. And, and I, I, I found that to be true. I think all of you could verify that, that, that it is just another set of eyes. And, and, and I cannot reiterate the fact that uh, if you see somebody, a family member, uh, as hard as it may be to stop the busy life that you have, the busy schedules you have, to at least listen, see what's going on, because uh, that is uh, definitely key. So. Uh, We'll talk now about human factors. I'm just going to go back down to the basics. And human factors, I got this from a, uh, uh, actually one of my classmates from college who has a, uh, a master's degree in human factors. And uh, he said there's two rules, very simple. Machines break, and people make mistakes. That's human factors 101 in a nutshell. I added one, uh, one kind of sub block that and that is that cultures endure and what I mean by that is that uh, when the, the fact that people make mistakes it's kind of like you accept a certain level a certain error level and, uh, and, and, and over time that becomes part of your culture it becomes ingrained in who you are and how you do business and, and, um, and, and it's very hard to turn that around and that's what we found out in aviation uh, I think that there are three factors that uh, allow cultures to change uh, if I can just get to the right page here. Uh, typically, cultures change because of some catastrophic event. A, a, a typhoon or a, or a tsunami washes out of town and people have to move. A survival instinct is another factor that causes culture to change. And the other uh, reason that cultures change is because of, uh, they're forced. Um, they're forced by regulation or by fiat. And in the case of aviation, uh, we had all three. We clearly, uh, we have, the, the, we fly machines and they break. Um, as far as people making mistakes, that's pretty obvious. And um, uh, whenever we have a catastrophic event, uh, we have a very, very strong survival instinct because we are the first people to the, uh, to the crash site. So we're highly motivated to change and uh, as I say, the, uh, the, the, the regulatory piece was, was all we needed to push us over the edge. And that was when the FAA and the, the National Transportation Safety Board said, you're going to do this. You're going to train to CRM. <laughs> so in CRM, we talk about uh, the challenges of, of performing in a high reliability environment from two different perspectives. On an individual level, uh, we address human limitations like fatigue and distraction and that sort of thing. And on a group level, we uh, recognize uh, that there are huge complexities in working as a group or as a team. And in the past, what we found, what we discovered was that teams really weren't working as teams, they were working as rooms full of individuals. And that, I think that is a, a very common characteristics in a, in, a, in a professional environment that you get a lot of experts in one room and they may not necessarily be talking to each other, they're, they're, and, and they're, they're actually uh, not, not fulfilling any definition of a team by any means. Uh, so we address those, we, we address the, what synergies and efficiencies that, we can, that can be gained when we uh, put groups of individuals uh, together. So how did we get to this point in uh, aviation? Why is it that we all of a sudden had this epiphany where we had to change things? In uh, the 60s and 70s, they introduced or the, the jet aircraft, which was first, I guess, invented. Jet engines were invented in uh, World War II. But but they were first applied to commercial aircraft in a big way in the 1960s. And uh, it made a huge, huge impact in, in aviation. In fact, it was so impactful, it was kind of like what penicillin did for healthcare. Um, airplanes or jet airplanes could fly faster, farther, higher. They could carry more payload. They were cheaper to operate. 
and, and another big factor is they could fly over weather instead of around it or through it. And uh, so therefore they uh, reduced the accident rate tremendously and they were safer. And what accidents that were left over were considered to be just a cost of doing business. And to kind of graphically show that, uh, the, uh, the graph starts in 1959 and you'll see the, the accident rate is on the, the, the left. Um, we had 40 accidents per million departures was the kind of the, what it started with in 1959 when jet aircraft really started coming into, into being. Within five years, uh, the accident rate was down to 10% of that for all, and this is for all commercial aircraft. The reason for that is that as they introduced jet aircraft into the, into the scene, <coughs> they, we had more reliability. We had, so the mechanical part of this human factors two-step process um, was actually hiding the fact that the human part had never been addressed. And so we still had a fairly significant um, level of, uh, of accidents. In 1970, <coughs> the black box was invented. Prior to that, we had no way of knowing when there was an accident, really had no way of, of knowing exactly what was going on on an, on an aircraft. And this black box, uh, there's a couple things about it. Number one, it's not black, it's actually international orange. And number two, it's not an it, it's a they. There's two boxes. Those boxes are for the cockpit voice recorder, which records all the communications in and out of the cockpit as well as inside of the cockpit. And, uh, and the flight data recorder, which which records uh, all the flight parameters, the, the most elementary information that it gives from the very, be or the, you know, back in its inception was uh, heading, altitude, airspeed, um, pitch and, and roll uh, positions of the aircraft. And um, some very basic stuff. Now they record thousands of parameters. And all of those things are set against a timestamp so that when there is a, an accident, we have uh, a way to track down, I mean, a very, very precise way to track down the pathology and, and the, what led up to it and what happened in the accident. And, and that's why when you get these reports, uh, you, you hear about accidents that happen when they do, when they are able to recover these, this data, um, the, 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 the reports are amazing how detailed they can be, how much they can tell about what happened and you never even saw it, you know, you never even, there's no way, there are no witnesses, but they can really, really put the piece together the, the precisely what happened and the, that caused the accident. So, as I say, the black box or black boxes um, expose the human factor uh, of this, or the, the human part of this human factors uh, two-step uh, model. And um, what they found was that, um, Airplanes were crashing at a, an alarming rate in the 1970s, not, not so much as they were in the 1950s and 40s because it was a whole different technology, but they were still crashing a lot of airplanes and up until they had this black box, they were thinking, well, that's just what we do. Uh, but then when they, in, in the early 1970s, we started with uh, several accidents. I'll start with, I'll just give you a series of three. And what they discovered was that there was a, a, a human part that was causing these things. In fact, the majority of these accidents were caused by people and not the machines. Uh, this one is Eastern Airlines uh, 441, which was uh, in the Everglades in 1972. Uh, there were uh, 103 fatalities out of 176. Uh, briefly, what happened in this circumstance? Uh, three guys in the cockpit, they were making an approach to Miami. The landing gear light, one of the lights did not come on showing that one of the gear might have been unsafe, but they didn't know whether it was a burned out bulb or whether the landing gear was truly not down and locked. So they, they chose to go into a holding pattern at 2,000 feet over the Everglades, middle of the night, totally dark. They couldn't, there were no stars, no, 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 ref, no visual horizon reference, so they couldn't really tell where the ground was. But they certainly could with their navigation tell what their altitude was. Uh, put the aircraft in an altitude hold mode, which at the time that airplane had a solenoid uh, altitude hold switch that if somebody hit the control column, uh, it would go into what's called a control steering mode, which would just, it would cause it to, to break lock on the altitude hold and it would just, whatever pitch attitude it was at at the time that it was released, if you didn't do anything else, it would just maintain that ad attitude. And, it, uh, and in this case, uh, it was still spinning circles because it maintained that, that roll attitude, 
but it started to descend slowly, 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 very slowly, right into the ground. And um, the reason for that was you got three guys in the cockpit, and all three guys were doing three different tasks, and it was just a light bulb. And um, they didn't know whether it was burned out, and then one guy is trying to change it, he doesn't know how to get the lens out, and another guy is trying to find a spare bulb, and another guy is looking up in the book, you know, how to, what do you do if the gear won't come down? But there was no coordination, and uh, this was the result. Uh, second accident is known as the, the most uh, horrific, or the, 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 big, the worst accident in aviation history, it happened in Tenerife, uh, probably uh, early in all of your lifetimes, or, or, very, or, or, or before you were born. But uh, this happened in uh, 1977, uh, 583 fatalities. Out of uh, 644 on board two 747s that collided on a foggy runway, uh, what was behind that accident again was lack of communication on several levels. Uh, the uh, inside the cockpit of one of the aircraft uh, was a Dutch crew, a KLM aircraft, and um, we had a. There are so many so many factors in this particular accident. So many CRM, I guess, violations or, or things that went on here. So it's hard to cover even a fraction, but, but there was a hierarchy issue inside the cockpit where the captain was the chief pilot for the whole airline. The co-pilot was a newly, uh, a newly certified co-pilot in the airplane, and the engineer was, at the time, considered the low man on the totem pole always. And so, so that we had this hierarchy structure that uh, we have since proven is not very effective. In fact, it's very dysfunctional. And so when it came time for somebody to say, God, this doesn't seem right. Did we really get clear for takeoff? Um, it turns out they were not. And uh, the, the co-pilot, instead of saying, no, we're not clear for takeoff, he just, he said, uh, are, we, are we cleared now? I mean, that was kind of the way he approached it, kind of hinted, and the captain says, yeah, we're cleared. And he put the power up, and away we went, and, and, uh, and crashed into another airplane that was on the runway. Um, the, uh, this, is a, this addresses one communication issue that we talk about called hinting and hoping, which is something that happens in professional environments where people don't want to uh, step on anyone else's toes, so they say things very, very uh, tepidly, and uh, it just doesn't work out so well in a high reliability or high risk environment where you have to, you have to get things done right now. Um, there were other communication issues, uh, language barriers. The tower controllers didn't speak English very well. They spoke Spanish primarily. And uh, so it was, uh, it was just a mess all around. And as I say, there were several other issues that were going on that uh, if I had three hours, I could address all of them. Uh, and then the final one was in 1978, uh, uh, DC-8 uh, was uh, coming into Portland, arriving in Portland. They also had a landing gear issue. And this was another issue where communication uh, failed between cockpit crew members, where uh, the, the, the captain was a cowboy. He was an absolute, uh, I mean, I'll, he was an ass. I mean, he was, he was a, one of those leaders that was uh, a leader by decree. He was not truly a leader. He was just a, a you know, crack the whip. And he intimidated the other crew members into just shutting up. And uh, so as the airplane was, was in orbit, you know, when they're trying to, to resolve this issue, with no plan, no communication of what the plan is, they just went into holding. And the captain didn't really say, well, this is what I'd like to do. Uh, the, uh, the other crew members were saying, you know, uh, or they were, you could tell from the cockpit voice recorder, they, they were hinting that they were running out of gas, and it wasn't until the first engine, actually until the second engine flamed out, that the captain realized, hey, we're running out of gas, and his words were something like, what's going on here? And these other two guys were, trying to, were saying, you know, we've been trying to tell you. And um, so the result was the airplane ran out of gas. And interesting, the picture here, uh, you'll notice there's no fire because there's no, no uh, uh, fuel to burn, no fuel. So. Uh, and those are just three of very, very many uh, crashes that happened in that time frame. And, and as I say, that was kind of the tipping point in 1978, uh, December 1978, when that happened. Um, and at that point, um, the NTSB, which I keep using these acronyms, the NTSB is the National Transportation Safety Board, which, which is a government agency that, that investigates accidents and and um, makes recommendations. They don't really have regulatory authority, but they make res recommendations. Um, but the NTSB, uh, the FAA, NASA, um, and the industry in general said, we've got to do something. You know, now we've exposed this big problem. We have to do something about it. So they, 
They uh, had a huge conference in uh, June of 1979 and, um, and, and came to some uh, pretty interesting conclusions when they, when they look, looked at the accident reports for all these accidents that had been going on. And one of the things that they discovered was that in 63% of the accidents, the slide may not be very readable, but in 63% of the accidents where they could identify what the cause was, meaning they had cockpit voice recorder and, or they had black box data basically, uh, where they could identify the cause, 63% were pilot error. Uh, it doesn't mean that there weren't other things going on. Um, in the case of the airplanes that had uh, unsafe landing gear indications, I mean, that happens a lot, but that's what we get paid to do is to solve those kind of problems without flying the airplane into the ground. Um, in the uh, NTSB conclusions was, uh, uh, or they said that the majority of accidents were flight crew actions uh, or inactions were were considered the cause of the accident. They identified inadequacies in leadership, communication, crew coordination, or also known as teamwork, and uh, decision making, <coughs> as opposed to technical proficiency. And what, what, what's interesting about this is, uh, up until this point, technical proficiency was considered the prime determinant in whether a guy could do the job. Uh, interestingly, now we've gotten to the point where we're assumed to be technically proficient. We, we, by the time we get to flying for an airline, we, we know how to fly an airplane. Uh, what, we, uh, what we get, I guess, graded on in large part when we have a, uh, a check ride uh, in, in very large part is how we work together as a crew. How do we make decisions? Typically when, um, when we go in for a check ride, if the check ride fails, which doesn't happen very often, but when it does, when we've screwed it up so badly that we have to go back and do it again, or, or um, you know, it's, 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 it's that bad, uh, the whole crew fails. It's not one person. They never, rarely anymore do they, unless the guy is just is totally checked out, um, they rarely fail one person. It's always the entire crew. So, um, <clears throat> now we'll talk about crew resource management and what it is. Uh, what the, what the magic is. It was first introduced in 1980. It took a long time to, to uh, become part of our culture uh, because it is such a huge shift in the way we do things. And uh, the first major save, we call it a save, uh, that is documented is uh, the United Airlines uh, flight that went into um, Sioux City, Iowa. And little, just a little bit of brief background on that and why that's considered a crew resource management save. Um, first of all, this, well, what happened in the accident was the, the, all the hydraulics failed in the airplane, which is supposed to statistically should have never, ever happened. But there was an explosion in the number two engine, which is the engine in the tail, and uh, the turbine exploded and it cut every hydraulic line in the, in the, in the airplane and all the hydraulics bleeded out. So there was nothing, this is a, you know, not a fly-by-wire airplane, but certainly fly-by hydraulics airplane, and uh, it was on fly uh, the, uh, the only way they could steer it was to uh, use differential thrust on the, the two outboard engines by just changing the throttle settings, and the only way they could change the altitude was, was by pulling back on the throttles to go down or pushing to go up, and that's, you know, in other words, changing the airspeed of the aircraft is what, you know, caused the amount of lift to change and so on. And, uh, that's, and, and those are pretty crude, uh, pretty crude ways to fly an airplane. In fact, um, the year that that happened, everybody that went through training on the, air, on the DC-10, and I was one, I was on that airplane when this, on the DC-10 at Northwest Airlines when this happened. And when I went through training, um, every one of us had to try to replicate that scenario. And I know of no one that was able to bring the airplane to, gr to the ground successfully. Everyone crashed, because, and, and when I say crash, I mean crash, you're done, lights out. In this case, <clears throat> there were 185 survivors out of uh, 296 on board. You would think, that's a lot of people died, but a lot of people's lives were saved. And uh, the uh, captain, uh, Al Haynes, uh, I, I think he's pretty much fully retired now, but. He was on the speaking circuit for a long time, and, every, and I've seen him a couple of times. And every time he speaks, he gives, he gives credit to crew resource management as being the, the key that brought that successfully uh, to, a, to a relatively successful conclusion where, by all rights, it should have been a total loss. 
Um, the things that happened in that flight, a uh, couple of things, there was an instructor pilot in the back of the airplane that knew the, uh, the aircraft backward and forward. He was uh, uh, highly uh, trained on, on, on the mechanics in the airplane. Uh, he sent a note up to the cockpit when he found out that something was wrong. He sent a note up to the cockpit and um, said, I'm here if you need me. Uh, Captain Haynes said, why not? And what he says when he gives his talk is that 10 years before that, he'd say, I'm busy. That would be his response. But in this case, he said, you know, it's a resource. It's something that I can use to get to, to help me out. Why not give it a try? So he brought this guy up. And the guy, this fourth pilot, the, the guy that came from the back, was really the one that brought the airplane to the ground because he knew it so well that he was able to do the steering. And, the, and he sat back in the, um, I don't know if he had a chair or what, but he sat right back behind the throttle quadrant. And that's, he just basically flew the airplane. Uh, the other key to the survival of uh, the people that did survive was that the, the, the communication with the flight attendants, which again, 10 years before, his response when he, when the, the, he would have told the flight attendants we're going to crash, you know, say your goodbyes, you know, that, that kind of would have been what the, the protocol, but uh, he, he spoke very directly to the flight attendants and prepared them for what was about to happen and kept them updated. And as a result, the flight attendants were able to adequately prepare the passengers for what was going to happen and what to expect. And, uh, and as a result of that, the, uh, the outcome was a lot better than what it, uh, what it originally should have been. The second big save was in 2009. Uh, the, uh, the US Air uh, Flight 1549 that uh, went into the Hudson. And uh, that again, Captain Sullenberger, who you've all seen in the news, and, and uh, he still show us his face a lot uh, in the media um, for, for, for good reason. Uh, again, credits CRM as being a, a, a major factor in how, that, how he brought that to a, uh, to a, a, a good conclusion. Um, if the, uh, now those are two, just two examples of CRM successes. But like so many things, when you've got, uh, uh, when things go right, you don't hear about them. And so every day, what we do in aviation, we have a lot of successes. They just don't make the news because there's no crash. There's nothing to talk about. Like, you know, if it, what is it the news people say, if it bleeds, it leads, but if there's no, you know, nothing, uh, nothing dynamic, you're not gonna hear about it. So, um, but the, so that's some anecdotal evidence, but if that's not enough, the statistical evidence is pretty amazing. And uh, this chart goes back to 1987. And basically, it's, uh, the, the, it's an accident rate per million flight hours versus time. And uh, you, can say it's, you can see that it's, it's on a steady decline. We've had a couple of other years where we had no accidents. But the fact that we've had two in, two in a row is, is just absolutely remarkable. And so it, uh, the, the system does work. So uh, what is crew resource management? And I'm going to keep looking at my watch because um, one of the things I talk about is fatigue. And one of the things that bothers me in a, in a, when I go to a talk is if somebody keeps me in my seat for more than an hour. So if we get to 8 o'clock and uh, we haven't taken a break, somebody start throwing something at me. So, um, But uh, what is crew resource management? Well, there's a, there's a classic definition that the FAA gives in all their uh, manuals and publications, and it's very simple. And, and I think very inadequate or very inaccurate, but it's basically CRM is a system of management that makes optimum use of all available resources to the flight crew to ensure safe and efficient flight operations. It's kind of weak, but uh, because uh, CRM is, is a lot more than, uh, than that. Let me get caught up here. The, uh, when we talk about CRM, we're talking about uh, that for certain, the recognition of resources and utilization of all the resources at hand. And that's, that's, that's kind of a mind thing. I mean, it's something that we, we have in our head all the time. Uh, instead of going right to the checklist or right to one thing that we've got memorized in our mind that we're going to do, uh, and, and we memorize very little um, as far as procedures and so on, but we, we tried to take a holistic approach or, or, or look at the whole picture and uh, and see what resources we have available, and we talk about it, and, and we, uh, we utilize them. But CRM is more of a culture, almost like a cult. Um, 
It, is, uh, it involves leadership and teamwork and, um, and, and kind of a risk management protocol and, and thought process. The uh, resources that we talk about, when we just talk about purely the resources, are the physical resources, obviously the, the, the technical, uh, are the uh, equipment, the technical manuals, procedures, technical knowledge, and the infrastructure that we operate in. And on the human side, uh, and this is kind of what we really, really stress with, with Sierra now, is the, the pilots, flight attendants, passengers, personalities, attitudes, air traffic control, dispatchers, teamwork, and communication skills. Um, and, and you'll notice, well, when CRM first came out, it was called cockpit resource management when they first initiated this program. And they very quickly realized, well, this has really pretty limited scope here. And so they changed it to crew resource management because they, they felt, and, and appropriately, that um, all uh, members of the crew, the, the, the flight crew, the ground crew, everybody should be involved in this. I mean, we all have to work together to, to come to a conclusion. and, and uh, and interestingly, on this list, we have passengers. I mean, we even include the passengers, and, and that's a very real thing that we do. Um, the flight attendants will tell you that when they're going through the airplane and, and telling you, uh, you know, you're sitting in an exit row, are you okay with that? They're not just checking with you to get an okay to use that exit row or that you know how to open a door. They're actually looking at the people, all those passengers. When they're checking your seatbelts, they're looking to see <coughs> what the threats are, if there may be security threats, but they're also looking to see where their resources are for passengers because if, if, if the uh, things start to go badly, either from a security standpoint or from a, a mechanical standpoint where we're gonna, we might be in danger of crashing or ditching an airplane, they want to know the people, and they want to have identified in, in advance the people that they can depend on to help them in this uh, situation. Um, we have uh, four what we call uh, crew performance indicators that we address when we talk about crew resource management. And these are pretty universal and pretty simple, pretty basic. Um, communication, uh, team building, workload management, and technical proficiency. And I'm gonna address each one of those individually, uh, kind of keep in mind that each one kind of intertwines with the other. In other words, you can't have a team you can't build a team unless you've got people talking to each other. Um, you can't uh, manage a problem that's in a, in a cockpit that's designed to have two or three people working together. You can't have that. You can't, you can't manage your workload unless you've got a team, unless you've got people that are really dedicated or, or uh, focused on, on, uh, on working together. So the first thing I'll talk about is communication. And um, this sign, this is more of a kind of a general concept, but read the sign. Um, you notice in the background is a hospital. Talk about confusing messages. And uh, what's interesting about this sign is uh, the uh, person that sent the picture to me was a doctor, or is a doctor, at Rhode Island Hospital. And at the time she sent me that picture, she also sent me a couple of other attachments, which were um, reports from the, I guess, the, I don't know, this is the Board of Medicine, or anyway, a state regulatory board for medicine. And there were two, actually two reports, and they were both like big, big fines for the hospital, like $500,000 each, uh, because of medical errors. These, this hospital was in such a rut, and they were making so many mistakes that they were, you know, doing the, the classic Ron site surgeries or uh, leaving uh, sponges in patients and, and, uh, and, and all those things were resulting, were, were adding up to where this hospital was in, uh, was getting fined and, uh, and I think she indicated there was some danger that the hospital might be shut down. But when she sent me this picture, she said, you know, if the people that quality control things like that, you know, are any indication of the culture that I'm in. I, there's, no, there's no reason, or there's no, no wonder that, <clears throat> that uh, we're having problems. There's no wonder that we're having wrong side surgery, we're making mistakes because you know, it's kind of a, kind of a, a, a strange message. Um, communication is, uh, is essential for uh, anything that we do. And uh, it's something that I want to stress. In fact, it's kind of the cornerstone of the entire CRM model. Uh, because without it, we, we really can't, can't go any further. It's a key ingredient to teamwork, and uh, 
and it's a skill that we can all learn, we can all do better. And uh, I think we're all at different levels of, of ability to communicate, and I, I think that, uh, I mean, just uh, between my wife and I, we've developed skills over time, you know, how to, how to get a point across. Um, I'm not a very good communicator. I admit or, or, or have not been. Um, I'm kind of one of those people that just, just like, I just kind of nod my head, and I still do uh, on occasion. Uh, rather than, uh, than, than actually address something because I just assume that the other person understands what I'm thinking, but it's not always true. But anyway, communication is a learned skill and, um, and certainly in, the, in, in each individual environment that you're in, uh, it, has to be, uh, it has to be used. But what's interesting about each of these uh, performance indicators is to look at the barriers that we have to each of these. Um, in the case of communication, <laughs> language is a huge, huge problem. Uh, we, Every flight that I do is an international flight. I go uh, either east or west, and uh, east I go to Europe, and, and which is typically not a problem, but going west, going to Asia, it is uh, oftentimes a problem. And imagine how difficult it is, the communication barriers we have when we have a, uh, a Chinese air traffic controller talking to a uh, Philippine uh, flight crew talking in English which is the second language for both those people. They don't, they just don't, um, the, neither one of them talk normally in that, in that language. And, and imagine the, the, the confusion that happens. And I'm listening to this a lot. And uh, of course I have the distinct advantage that uh, English is the international language for aviation. So just about everywhere I go in the world, we, we you know, it's, it's not a real hard thing for us. Uh, but it, it, is a, it is a big problem. And, uh, and it's, a, it's a big problem to, make sure that you hear what's really being said. And I know that in, in healthcare or any, actually any industry, uh, we have a lot of people from other countries and, um, and it's a barrier that we need, to, uh, we need to address, we need to be recognized and address it by um, uh, awareness and finding a common language in what we do. Obviously, uh, un unsupportive or punitive work environments it's hard to get anything done or to communicate when you've got uh, disagree we've got you know, disagreements and some somebody uh, you know hanging over your, your head uh, steep and strict hierarchies that was always a problem and in fact the examples that I gave you about the uh, United Airlines uh, flight going into Portland that ran out of gas uh, that was a hierarchy issue in fact the other two were in to some extent hierarchy issues too where the captain was king. <coughs> And uh, people were intimidated and afraid to speak up when something was wrong. Lack of training, stress, uh, both personal and work-related are, uh, are barriers. Uh, people under, st under stress tend to communicate less frequently and less uh, effectively, and I can uh, vouch for that. And then finally, conflict is another uh, huge thing. When people are at odds with one another, it's kind of hard to get a message uh, across. Um, I'm going to give an example of a language uh, communication problem. Uh, this is a short video that, uh, that sort of illustrates that. Das hier ist mein Sektor. Das hier ist das wichtigste Gerät des Küstenwächter. Das Gerät und das Gerät. Überlebensradar. Mayday, Mayday. Hello, can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you... Okay, over. I mean, we are sinking. We are sinking. Hello? This is the German Coast Guard. We are sinking, we're sinking. What are you thinking about? <laughs> so true. <clears throat> so true. <clears throat> I'm going to wrap up communication, then we'll take a short break. Um, another aspect of communication, this is huge. Silence is not golden. Um, it is not the thing to do. And... Uh, as I mentioned about the patient advocate, as well as everyone else in this room, if you see something wrong, you need to speak up. Um, in, uh, I think it's two thirds of the aviation accidents that were addressed in this, uh, this big meeting that occurred in 1979 with the NTSB and FAA and so on. Uh, one of the things they found was that in two thirds of those accidents, a flight crew member knew something about what was about to happen that could have stopped that accident from happening, but they failed to speak up. They, uh, they were either intimidated or they were scared or they, but their culture didn't, uh, the culture did not like encourage them to say something when they could have or should have. 
But on the medical side, um, I have an example from Dr. Peter Pronovost, and I'm sure that most of you have heard of him, uh, another Johns Hopkins person. Um, and uh, he writes in a book called Safe Patients in Smart Hospitals. He says that, uh, let me get to the, oh, there we go. Uh, he did a, a survey or did a, some research where he went into, I don't know if it was the whole hospital or a department of the hospital, but he looked at liability claims, lawsuits, and, uh, and tried to, to, to look at, to pull out errors that did substantial harm to patients. And in nearly 90% of those cases, somebody in the, in the team, somebody in the, in the chain knew something and either kept silent or they uh, spoke up and nobody listened. So the, 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 the whole listening thing, the whole speaking up thing is like crucial. And you, if you're not doing that, if you're not aware of that barrier, uh, you're not you know, doing everything you can. The other issue that they brought up was hinting and hoping, and this is something I referenced before. In any kind of professional environment, even in a marriage, you, you I know I can speak from personal experience, you don't want to step on toes, you don't want to hurt somebody's feelings, and, and so, and, but particularly in a professional environment, you don't want to like say, you know what, you, you, you're screwed up, you know, or, or kind of indicate that. And so, uh, so people tend to hit and hope. They tend to say, um, you know, like my wife would, would, might say something like, you're not going to go out like that, are you? And that's the message that, you know, your pants and your shirt don't match or something. Uh, but that is a huge, uh, a, a huge issue. And the way we address it is that we, we, uh, we learn to, to, uh, to talk directly to the other person. And uh, it's so important to do that. But when I talk about culture, the culture allows that because most captains, <coughs> most leaders in this industry will say right off the bat, if you see something, I want to hear about it. And, and so they've kind of opened the door for you to, to, uh, to, to input. Um, to input directly and not to do so uh, by just uh, dropping a hint. The last thing on communication I want to talk about uh, is handoffs. And uh, this is kind of a subspecialty. Dr. Ellenbogen just said, you know, this is something that really needs to be, you know, if you could just tell us what you do and how you go about it. This is a, uh, this sheet here is just a one of two pages of a checklist or set of checklists that we have in the cockpit all the time for an, any, any international flight. And it's basically, a, a, it's, it's something that we pull out at certain times during the flight to do certain things. Uh, but one of the things, one of the sections on that checklist is a, a crew change briefing, which is a handoff. Now our handoffs are not nearly as critical or stressful as, as they might be in healthcare. So it's, it's sort of, there's a little apples and oranges thing here. Because when we do a, a crew change, uh, typically it's, well into the flight, you know, we're talking about a 10 hour flight, so three hours into the flight, the guy comes back from his break and he comes into the cockpit and another one goes back, or, or two guys come in and two guys go back. Um, but it's usually in a very low, low stress environment. But the point is, every time we pull that checklist out and we look at it, because I can tell you, every time I've tried to do it without it, even though there's not many, many things on there, like when it's time for me to go back to my break and I, and I fail to pull that checklist out, and I go back to the break, and I get in the bunk, and I realize, oh gosh, I never told them about that other thing. You know, that there's something that I missed. And so it's so important to, to you know, this, this kind of refers to the whole checklist con concept. It's so important, uh, and, and we know, to pull that thing out and go through each step. And the, the steps, I don't think I need to go through what each of these things, um, each of these points is, but the, the basic point is that, that you want to give the, the person coming on board uh, the the big scope and any particular items that might be of concern. And keep in mind when we have a changeover, a crew changeover, the guy that is coming up is usually just kind of just woken up from a nap. So and it might be in the middle of the night, so he might be a little blurry eyed. And it just gives more credence to the fact that you need to use a checklist to, uh, to, to cover those, uh, those things. 99% of the time for us, the handoff is a pretty seamless, pretty quick process. But whenever there's something big, that's the first, that goes to the top of the list. If there's something that uh, the, the oncoming person needs to know, and that's really, really important. In other words, you want to highlight it. You want to, when, in our case, we have a 
flight plan, a paper flight plan that we carry on a clipboard and we'll make notes on it. For instance, at this fix you need to get hold of this controller and the frequency is listed. Or if there's an issue in the medical issue in the back that you've been dealing with coordinating with uh, the, uh, uh, what is it, the Philadelphia, Philadelphia Clinic, whatever it is, the clinic that, I've forgotten the clinic that we deal with because it happens so rarely, but, but if you're uh, trying to do a coordination with the flight attendants and, and, and trying to work out how we're going to deal with a, with a medical issue in the back of the airplane, um, that obviously would go to the top of the list if there's a security issue or a threat or anything like that. And th those are the things that really stand out and that's important. It's extremely important in the changeover to highlight those things. You know, the routing and the altitude and all that stuff is nice, uh, but it's the changes and it's the abnormalities that we, uh, that we tend to, uh, we, we need to concentrate on on the, on the changeover. Uh, talk a little bit about team building. Um, I don't want to just read through the bullets, but uh, the team building, as you might have surmised, is, is a huge uh, part of this process. And, uh, and again, it is a cultural issue about uh, knowing that you're all part of one big group trying to get to a, to a, a goal. Um, the uh, team members are typically encouraged. One of the parts of it is, is, is that a team member is encouraged to, to participate. And as I said, in the, uh, it's kind of all about leadership. Team, team building is about leadership and it comes from the top. It comes from, in the case of the aircraft, uh, from the captain and the first how he opens that door uh, sets the tone for the rest of the of the flight or the trip and what I mean by that is uh, oftentimes we have uh, like when we leave Seattle on a flight uh, we are highly encouraged to go down and talk to the flight attendants the typically the captain is supposed to do that they have a briefing room and then he goes down and talks to them introduces himself and um, uh, I have found that to be the most uh, effective thing that we can do. I've complained a lot through the years about the way we get treated in the cockpit. There's just this cultural thing that happened way back in the 60s or 70s between flight attendants and pilots, and I don't know, in, at least in Northwest Airlines, and I don't know what it was, but it's like I, I saw how we were getting treated sometimes, and it's like, I wouldn't treat my next door neighbor that way if I couldn't stand the guy. You know, at least if he came to my door, I'd offer him a glass of water. But the flight attendants and the pilots, for some reason, there was just this 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 kind of acrimonious thing that was going on. And um, and and oftentimes we wouldn't get fed or or or, or watered or you know <laughs> kind of have to take care of ourselves. Um, and that that culture has changed through time. But one of the things that I found that's most effect this is so amazing because I like to eat. Uh, is uh, if I go and introduce myself to the flight attendants and I give them just the basic stuff, take five minutes of my, of my briefing time and I go and I say, um, this is me and this is, uh, here's the flight time, here's the weather, here's what you might expect. Uh, and then I say, what can I do for you? I'll back you up in, in, in anything that comes up. If it's a security issue, I trust your judgment. And then I say, what can I do for you? What's important to you? And that makes such a difference and I can say since I started doing that consistently I haven't missed a meal so um, but the team building is a huge huge uh, uh, part of, of, of what we do and, and it's just as I say it's so important to get everybody kind of on the same uh, page this uh, is about how not to build a team this is about first impressions and back in the um, 80s when we started CRM training Northwest Airlines did a few videos that were kind of funny uh, they, uh, this one is, we call it, uh, we have two of them called the, the good captain video and the bad captain video. This one is the bad captain video because the good captain video is just kind of boring. But um, the bad captain video is, uh, the setup is this. This is a 727 cockpit. I apologize for the, in advance for the quality of the video because it's pretty old. It's been re-recorded a number of times. Uh, but the, uh, the captain knows that there's a hidden camera in the cockpit. So he's, he's, He's in on the, on the gig. Uh, the co-pilot and the second officer uh, are on the right side, and um, they don't know that this is a, a setup. And the objective is the captain comes in and he just acts like kind of a jerk. Kind of the typical, you know, hey, I'm king, do what I say, shut up, do your job. And, uh, 
and, and it's interesting to watch the reaction uh, on the part of the, uh, the crew. I just came off with three days good time, but you did have to, you know, I, I, I just had a week of vacation, I pretty much sat down, fixed up the house for the and stuff like that. Well, when we didn't do the end, uh, I'm going to move on a little bit, uh, chill. little gesture at the end. <laughs> and keep in mind, those two guys on the right had no idea that they were being filmed, that this was a setup. And, 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 and that so clearly epitomizes what goes on in somebody's head when they realize, this guy's a jerk. I don't want to work for him. So imagine starting out a very you know, important part of your life, a flight, uh, with that kind of an attitude, that kind of a situation. Thanks for the pointer. I might need it one more time. <clears throat> So some of the barriers, once again, that's the most interesting stuff. Uh, authority or lack of authority or improper authority. Uh, not including the entire crew, I've tried to emphasize that, that having everybody on board makes just a huge difference in how things go. Uh, Fair to adapt as situations change, which they always do. I know in your industry, it's a, it's a moving target and then uh, stress and conflict. One way that we handle uh, uh, operational conflict is, uh, is talking. But here is an example of one way maybe not to handle it. This is another video and this goes back to uh, the, the setup is that uh, it's from the high and the mighty and this is kind of a classic. Just about everybody is, I'm sure has seen this but it's always worth seeing again where uh, John Wayne is the co-pilot, Robert Stack is the captain and, and uh, Robert Stack is, uh, is really a sweat in this situation and he wants to ditch the airplane and, and uh, John Wayne is saying, oh, not so fast. Weldy, check your final position. I'm going to take her down. Wait a few more minutes, Captain. Do as I say. Well, it looks like... Do as I say. Give me a few more minutes. I've already waited too long. Here we go. No, we don't. Get a hold of yourself, you... No, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's just... <coughs> Just another tool to put in your arsenal. Uh, workload management, the third of the CPIs that we're going to talk about, uh, is uh, again uh, uh, critical in uh, how we handle uh, task management, task distribution, prioritization, um, time management, and uh, situational awareness. All these things are, are core to this uh, workload management concept. Once again, some of the barriers, um, <clears throat> these are huge. Uh, and, and I think that you can relate to just about all of them. Fatigue, uh, I'll talk about that in a moment. Hunger, physical environment, emotional state, uh, whether you're bringing something to work or, or not. Um, you know, whether it's something that, that happens, you know, stress that, that's occurring because of the job. And, I, and I'll stop at that one for a moment. Uh, I was. When we were writing this book, the, one of the co-authors uh, was picking my brain about how we do things and how we communicate. And one of the things she was really surprised about was that we're really caring and sensitive guys. Um, when I show up to work and I've got something on my mind, I know that it's important to communicate that to my crew members, to, to the other guys in the cockpit. Say, you know, uh, <clears throat> we went through a pretty dark time. My, my wife and I with one of our kids years ago, which seems like everybody does, <laughs> but, but uh, you know, I showed up to work and, and I, we had had a, just, a, just a horrific night before because of something that she did or, or, or something that happened. 
Um, <clears throat> it, that's important enough that I would say, you know, we got some stuff going on at home, just watch my back. And just that is enough, you know, uh, relaying that to the other people in the team actually makes a difference because then it lets the other people know, you know, maybe if he missed something on a checklist or, he, you know, missed some other thing, uh, there might be a reason for it. And so have a little extra vigilance. Uh, <clears throat> I'll talk a little bit about multitasking and complacency as well. And then, of course, uh, interruptions are huge uh, and uh, workload, uh, the training, medical issues, drugs and alcohol, all these things are factors in effective workload or barriers in, uh, to effective workload management. I'll talk about um, these three things, break these out. Fatigue, I think, is <clears throat> a huge issue. I know it's a huge issue in healthcare. It's a huge